Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Say, if you leave all the waters up here, I might preach for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Grab my water. <coughs> Give me a bucket of sand or something. Mm. Ooh, God is so good. Mm. God is so good. Mm. All good. Mm. Praise the Lord. Wow. He is so good and wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know what heaven, I mean, you know what Christmas is? That he came down from glory. Mm. I mean, he was on his throne there. And he said, I'm going down there, God. I'm going down there, Father. Just amazing. Mm. It's very personable, you know, this Christmas thing. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. It's very intimate. Mm. Come on, brother. Because I know he had come for just one of us. Mm. Mm. Amen. Amen. It's for you, Rose. All for Rose. Jesus was there and he goes, Man, it's all about Rose. I'm coming for Rose. And I'm coming for Lindsay and that boy right there, too. I'm coming for you. Come on. Yes. And he just come for all of us, John. Daryl, he loves us so much. That's wow. Matt. Wow. He's so good. He's so good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I got such a blessing out of that video. Hey. Watching that little girl shout as she got her toys and stuff from our, our people. Mm. Why are we shouting like that when we get every gift that he gives us? Amen. Mm, we ought to be. Mm -hmm. right. God has yeah. blessed this church so much. Yes. Did you go to Mexico and touch that little girl's heart? God is working in wonderful ways around here. And we need to be open to his will. You know, I get to go to uh, Mexico Baptist Church. Uh, who helped us put the roof on this place that we're trying to blow the roof off now. Amen. Amen. And uh, the pastor there called me last week or so and asked me to come down and do a revival. So I'm going down the end of January and do a revival at their church. And I'm going to preach to them about faithfulness and about evangelism. And I think, wow, you know, uh, well, I'm still praying through that, but that's... Uh, uh, along that lines, and I think you know to what Betty's saying. You know, I get down, I get depressed. We all do. We think about things, and then, but we got to really wake ourselves up and say, really, what is going on? I mean, if you look around and what God is doing in, in our lives and in our hearts and the ministries and through His people, man, we don't have any. We don't. We you know, we can get down. Our we got to get back up again, and we got to get back with what God's doing, and because God is doing so many good things. And we should just give him praise and glory. Amen. And to see that little child open that bag. Now you tell me it wasn't worth packing those backpacks. You tell me it wasn't worth going to Wally World or wherever else we went and got to get this stuff to put them in. And what's going to happen next Saturday, I think that kind of blew by everybody on the announcement. Listen, folks, we get to be a host site this year for the first time where we're going to, the kids are going to be coming here to get the backpacks. And but we are getting our own kids. So if you have children and you know children that could use the backpacks, our children, we want to take care of our people too, not just everybody else's, but our kids too. We want you to bring those children. And you say, Amen, there's some kids down the street, or I got some kids in the neighborhood, and say, you know, I got and John, you you got you bring yours next Saturday. Then you say, you know, I got 10 more to live down the street. You pile them all into something and bring them out here. Because we want them all to come. Amen. And you bring kid and you bring kids here. We get to do that. But next Saturday, it's gonna be an all I mean, it's we're gonna have food, we're gonna they're gonna, you know, it's more than just the backpacks. It's gonna be a great day of celebration. And to watch the joy in these kids' face, I ain't gonna forget that either. That little girl is just opening that present up and and Travis I I mean, you got to witness it right there. I mean, that's awesome. And that's the joy of being involved in ministry. Amen. You know, church isn't about just fellowship. Come on, brother. Come on. You know, a lot of churches get together. I, I'm, I'll preach here on my message in a little bit. But a lot of churches, they think ministry is when we get together and have a meal. Come on. Or we're going to have this, or we're all going to get together, or we're going to have a committee meeting. 
or we're going to have a meeting about this, or we're going to get together and, 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 you know, now last night was a fellowship when all the youth came over. We had a great time, and that's all good, and we all like to eat, and that's okay too, but that is not ministry. Ministry is what you saw in the video. Ministry is next Saturday. Ministry is these children, and ministry is still out there, and we haven't even begun to do all the ministry that God has for us. Right. We haven't even, we're just broaching. We're just now getting into this building. I mean, we've been at this a while. Some of you have been here since the beginning. I'm looking at Bud and Debbie. You know, you guys have been here since the beginning, and, and we think, wow, we've come so far. And we've been, and you know, what are we, 14 years old in January? 15 years old, is that? Wow. We started in 05. That's 14 years. 14 years, right? That's the new man. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and we've got in this building and we think, okay, now it's time to relax. No, it isn't. It's time to get up and get moving because we're just beginning and we haven't touched this community enough yet. Just a little bit. Just a little bit that we if we reach this community. There's so much more to do. And God's just looking down. That's why I love Child Evangelism Fellowship and all the different areas. Any way, anywhere we can go to reach people for Christ, that's what we need to be doing. Amen. And folks, listen, we come to church today. This is not all that it's about. Amen. It's not. Some people. Okay, here we go. Some people come to church and we and they get there, and my my former pastor said this word, and I've used it before as well. They come for their Baptist mass. Come on. Well, let's go to church on Sunday, and then okay, let's get home and watch the Bengals, and we'll go on with life as it goes. And usually when you watch the Bengals, it goes downhill from there. <laughs> but it's like, okay, this is my Baptist mass time. Oh, I went to church, I'm done. Dust off the Bible, I'll be there next Sunday. Folks, that's not the Christian life. Right. right. We come here to get our energies, to get our batteries charged. We come to worship and the fellowship. Hebrews says not to forsake the assembling of one another. This is just to come together. And church, I want to tell you all something. I love you all dearly. Y'all need to come to church on Wednesday nights. Now I'm meddling. We need to come to church on Wednesday nights. We have prayer meeting here. And I've sat in here and prayed by myself. I've sat in here and prayed by myself. It's not right. We need to come to church on Wednesday nights. And I know some people have got stuff. I get that. And you can't be here every week. But that home, we need to make an attempt to come. And we can do everything else. Let's come to church on Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights is fun. It's a good time. And I can encourage you and I encourage you, but then I get to a point where you know you just need to show up. Right. I'm stepping and meddling today, but that's the way it is. That's where we pray. <laughs> oh, I can pray at home. Yeah, you sure can and you ought to. All day long. But there's something about corporate prayer. When you know when you hear little stories about children and their hearts are being healed. Literally, physically, spiritually, in all ways. And when prayer moves, when God hears the prayer, the people, his people come together and pray, he moves in different ways than he does from your one prayer. That's a truth. I mean, he, he listens and moves when people come together and pray. It's all through the scripture. It matters, folks. Make time in your schedules to come. And then that's for prayer. That's to get us through the rest of the week. And then we need to discover our ministries. We need to discover what can I do? What can I do here? How can I serve here? Everyone should be calling me up on Thursdays and going, Brother Tim, how can I serve? I shouldn't be calling people begging for children's workers. We should have a waiting list, Travis. A waiting list of people saying, let me serve the children. No, no, let me serve the children. No, no, let me serve the children. And I said before, if there's ever, if we don't have a children's worker back there, I'll let me know. Because I'm going back. And we don't need a sermon. We need to serve the children. We need to serve in ministries. And you need to look around because there's a lot of ministries. And that's what we're want to do and we're about. So let's serve. Let's serve. And quit being served. Let's serve. That's what this church is about. That's why God put us here. And you get to be, we get to be a part of that. 
I know I'm kind of coming down on you a little bit today, but, all, but my goodness, look what God is doing. And folks, the, the house ought to be full tomorrow night. It ought to be full this morning. It ought to be full and we ought to be having another problem with where we're going to park everybody, where we're going to get built. People said, where's the next building? Well, you know what? We're looking around. Look around right now. We're not even half full today. The church should be full. We need to reach people and tell people. We need to invite people to, the, to come to church. And we need to plug in with some ministries. I don't want to step on your toes too bad. If you're coming to church, I appreciate it. Praise the Lord. But that's not what the Christian life is about. It's much, much, much more. And I know some of you serve in all these different <laughs> ministries and do all kinds of different things. And I just praise the Lord for that. I have no idea all the stuff that's going on. I know there's a lot of good stuff that goes on, and I get to hear about it. So I praise the Lord for all that. But let's, let's look at what we're doing and really sit and say, you know, we can go to church and, and, and feel really good and everything, but really there's so much more that God has for us. I don't think we've even begun to tap it yet. This is some of the things I want to say to the church in revival and what I want to say to the 70-something churches in our association, but what we ought to start to say right here to this church, you know, we've got so much more God wants to do in and through us, and we're just beginning, just beginning, and we're doing, and there, we're doing some good things. It's really all so good, but I'm telling you, it can be so much more that God wants to do. I think we should be having baptisms every few weeks. Amen? Amen. I remember sharing this last year. I said, you know, I counted them up. I keep track. If you've been baptized in this church, your name is in the history on the, on the thing that's there. And I said, we've had 60 or 70 baptisms. And somebody went, wow. And I'm like, wow, that ought to be one year, not 14 years. We ought to have 30 or 40 baptisms every year. We should be able to do that. We should. If we're, if we're teaching children and, and youth and young people and reaching our community, I, I mean, my whole neighborhood's lost. Is yours? Yeah. So, folks, let's, let's let God do all that he wants to do through us. Amen? Amen. Please call me. I'll pray with you and say, what, how can I help? I haven't had that phone call in a long time. I have not had anyone call me and say, how can I help? What can I do? How can I plug into something? Teach me, show me something. Folks, let's do it. Amen? Amen. I'm so, uh, so let's, uh, let's get to the message today. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father God, Father, that's been burdened in my heart for a long time just to share. And Father God, you are doing so many good things through this church. And I thank you for each person that's part of it. I thank you, Lord God, for what you have done, what you're doing, and what you're going to do. I thank you for planting us here. Lord God, and help us to realize, Lord, there's so much more that you want to do in our homes, Lord God, in our personal lives, in our own walks, in our families, in our neighborhoods, and in our churches and our communities, Lord God, that we can really reach out. And why not this church? Why not right here today, Lord, that we as a body repent? And Lord God, when the invitation comes, why not everybody come to the altar and pray and say, Lord God, do in us what we cannot do for ourselves, Lord God. Do in us what, you, what your vision is for us, what your heart is for us. Lord God, let us pray. Let us commit ourselves to your work and ministry, Lord God. Let us not just come to church and think, well, that's it. Because, Lord, that's just the beginning. Help us to realize this, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for all the, that you're doing, Lord God. Thank you for that little girl in Mexico. Thank you for her heart. Thank you for her smile and her enthusiasm, Lord, and just the joy. That, Lord God, that was you. 
That was you in that backpack, Lord God. That was you that that, that, that girl was just unpacking, Lord God. It was you. I pray for her soul right now, Lord God. If she doesn't know you personally, that she receive you as Lord and Savior. But Lord, speak to us now in this time as we open up your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. We're continuing in this series about people of the story. And the greatest story ever told is the gospel of Jesus and Luke when he comes. But there's always uh, the sermon series, as I've shared before, is about other people that are part of the story. And I hope that you understand that God is still writing the story. Until, the G until Jesus comes back and establishes his millennial kingdom, the church story is still being written. And folks, you're part of that. There's no more Bible being written, but the church age, you're part of that. All of the work that you're doing, your hands, it's all still being written. And we still have tremendous opportunity to do many things and be involved. I praise God I get to be just this much of what God is doing in this world. I get to be part of that. And I'm just thankful for it. And we see these people that are in the story of Jesus. We, we're, we're looking at Joseph today. We're going to look at Mary next week, Lord willing. Let's look at Joseph today. And saw and see how because of his righteousness, his faithfulness, and his obedience, that the story all unfolded. I mean, can you just imagine... When, when Jesus is getting ready to come as a baby, they had to find this woman named Mary. They had to find this man named Joseph. They had to find two people that were going to be obedient and serving and, and would, would be able to do what they needed to do to raise Jesus. And, and, and I think Mary is just a... a, 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 a as, as, as people call her the favored one, she is highly favored. And Joseph, and, and, and Joseph was such an awesome guy, an awesome man of God. Let's look at his story today, Matthew chapter 1. Now, I, I've mentioned last week that the gospel messages are primarily in Matthew and Luke, the, the story of Jesus and the birth. The, the, of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But primarily the gospel, or the, not the gospel, the gospel's in all four. But the story of the birth and the, and the things, the events around the birth are in, in Matthew and Luke. And I also mentioned that Matthew was written uh, with uh, Joseph's story more so, and Mary's story you see more in the gospel of Luke. And Matthew was written, as, as it's been said, primarily to the Jewish people. Matthew, as you know, was a tax collector. And he's writing to all Christians, but obviously all Christians, the Gospels are written to. But he's written with a Jewish audience in mind. So it's important to understand that because Matthew, right off the bat, he sets it up and he's, talk, he's going to talk about the genealogy. Because for the Jewish people, it was all about the genealogy. So that is why he starts his book and he says the book in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So he's right away putting it down, right away and putting it in place that Jesus Christ is the one. He is the son of David and the son of Abraham. And then over in verse 16, you can read the genealogy because it goes through all the people in there. And then in verse 16, it says, And to Jacob was born Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom, in other words, by whom is singular, talking about Mary, uh, because it was conceived, because Jesus was, was conceived by the Holy Spirit with Mary, in Mary, by whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Everything that they held dear, all of the scripture, everything that they treasured up to this point, everything that they knew was culminating in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you get it and understand that the Old Testament, the law, everything up to this point was all pointing and leading to the person 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you, uh, do you understand that even in Genesis, after the fall, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God said, I will put enmity, enmity, which is strife, between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. He's talking to the devil. And he says, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head. In other words, a death blow to Satan. And you shall bruise him on the heel. In other words, when Jesus was on the cross. And they would actually get a bruise uh, on their heel from pushing up and pushing up on the cross. But have you ever wondered, leave that verse up for a moment. And I think I've shared this before. Have you ever wondered and thought, why is there so much spiritual warfare going on in our world? And I won't go into it any more than this, but just to let you know, God put it there. God did it. Mm -hmm. And he goes, no, he didn't. It's the, it's the fight between good and evil. Well, yeah, it is a fight between good and evil. God did it. Now, that's a whole other message we can talk about. You want to call me this week, we can talk about that. But God put this warfare there. God did it. Because there needs to be a war and a fight between good and evil. For Psalm, uh, let me read Psalm chapter 89, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 89, 3 and 4. It says, For I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish, establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. The covenant and everything that was made through all the way back to Noah and Abraham and David and all the Old Testament covenants that were made. Everything and everything in the Old Testament was all pointing to Jesus and the new covenant, which it was made in his blood. You understand this? That he was the fulfillment of all of those covenants. They would all culminate in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And per Luke 133, the writer there said that Jesus' kingdom would have no end. And we go to Galatians 3.16. See, it's all through the scripture, folks. Galatians uh, 3.16 says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed, and that is Christ. Amen. So all the time from Genesis, where it all started, in the middle of the book in Psalms, and in the, in the gospel message, it was talking about the culmination of all of these covenants would be in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, like uh, Donna was mentioning uh, earlier on, that Jesus is coming back. Amen. Right. Amen. And in Revelation chapter 19, put that up there, brother. Revelation 19, 16, it says, On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. So it's been about Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew was saying, it's Jesus the, the, from the Old Testament right up through Psalms, right up through the New Testament, and we can go all the way to the end, and it's always been about Jesus, always has been, always will, and everything in the Old Testament, all the covenants, everything all comes to Jesus, and it all comes to Christmas, to the coming of our Lord and Savior. See, that's what Christmas is. It's a, it's a culmination of all of this. But let's look at Joseph's story in Matthew 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. This doesn't happen every day. Matter of fact, it will never happen again. It's only happened now. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man. Now, what made Joseph righteous? It's a good question. What makes you righteous? Let me ask that another. What makes you so righteous? <laughs> if I ask you that question, what are you going to say? Miss Casey, what makes you so righteous? 
Amen. She got the answer. It's the blood of Jesus that makes us righteous, right? There isn't one righteous, not any. But in Christ, we find our righteousness. In him, we are righteous. So what made Joseph righteous? What made Abraham righteous? What made Noah righteous? What made David righteous? It was their faith. It was faith and reckoned into him. It's in Hebrews 11. It talks about that. It's the Hall of Faith chapter. And it says Abraham believed and in him it was reckoned into him righteousness. See, Joseph was righteous. He was a righteous man because he lived by faith. And he did not want to disgrace Mary. He desired to put her away secretly. Now, today, the whole thing of marriage has been completely decimated by man. Just completely torn from what God intends. Amen? You all know that, right? It's, it's, I almost want to come up with a new word to define what God's... I always say Christian marriage now when I talk to people. Instead of just marriage, I say Christian marriage. Because it's completely different. But here it was, they were engaged. They were not to consummate the marriage, obviously, until after they were married. And now she is with child. So this would have been socially extremely unacceptable. Matter of fact, they could have, could have even been stoned. They were, they had the discipline and they took action to protect the sanctity of God's plan for marriage. Now, Joseph, regardless of his pride, he put his pride aside and he said, you know, I love Mary and I got, I'm going to put her away secretly. You know, I'm not going to call attention to this because I really love Mary. Now, we know from the story that God speaks to Joseph. And we know that I'm sure him and Mary had some conversations as well. And we know that but through his righteousness, and listen, this is really key, because of his faithfulness, because of his righteous living, he was able to get it. He was able to hear it, and he was able to receive it. How many of us men would be in that situation would struggle? But Joseph knew because God told him. He said, man, when God tells me, I know it. Sometimes we have a hard time hearing God. He, he knew because of his righteousness. He knew. And because of that, he was able to receive it and to believe it. But when he had considered this, verse 20, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now, how many of you go to bed at night and God shares that in a dream? You're going to wake up and go, wow. So a couple things. Number one, he didn't act in haste. I always like to call attention to that. He slept on it. Sometimes that's what we need to do. Anybody ever went to bed praying and woke up praying? We all done that. I get sermons sometimes in the middle of the night. I wake up, I'm like preaching a sermon at 3.30 in the morning. And, you know, and everybody's sleeping except for me. <laughs> kind of like church on Sunday. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, he slept on me. And he was in, a, in an attitude in a state of prayer. And God spoke to him and said, she has what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. For it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now he had to know his Bible. He had to understand. He had to go to Sunday school. He had to understand what was going on here. Because he knew that there was a Messiah that was to come. And he was going to be his earthly father. Verse 22, all this took place that was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled. This is from Isaiah. Verse 23, behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which we just sang, which translated means God is with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep 
And he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He didn't barter. He didn't think about it anymore. God spoke. He knew it. He knew what he was supposed to do. He understood and he was obedient. He was obedient. And he took her as his wife and he kept her a virgin. He did what he knew was right in that regard until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. He slept on her. You know, there were several times that God appeared to Joseph in a dream. Here he did. He spoke to him there. And then he told him to take the child to Egypt. Remember? Mm -hmm. And then he said to bring him back from Egypt. He told him that in a dream as well. And then even when he was on his way back from Egypt, he then told him about the king. God did in a dream and said, now take him to Galilee. And that's how they wound up in Nazareth, which would also <laughs> be why the, the prophecy, he shall be called a Nazarene. Right? But Joseph listened, and he always acted. And folks, here's my summation from this whole passage. Difficult earthly situations are overcome by divine guidance. Amen. By living in faithfulness, righteousness, obedience, doing what you know is right, trusting God to guide you and direct you. Difficult stuff is overcome by God's divine providence and guidance. He did it for Joseph. Now, Luke chapter 2, another little bit of the story. We only have time for just a little bit. There's more here as you read. But Luke 2, 21. When the eight days were completed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for the purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now remember, they were still living under the law. You know, you guys realize this, right? Jesus lived under the law. You know, his, his ministry that, you know, his, you know, his ministry uh, was that he lived every day and didn't sin. And he lived under that law, which no one could live under, but he did. <coughs> Why? To carry a cross up Calvary. But they were still living under the law. So they took him up according to the law. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Verse 23, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So all the stuff that Joseph was going through, all of the stuff where they went to Bethlehem, all of the stuff where they couldn't get the hotel or a place to stay, the, the visit of the wise men, all the things that he had went through, the census and everything that he did, and, and remember that they traveled about uh, close to 90 miles on the Donkey Express, with a pregnant woman. Okay. That's what they did. And then they turn around and they go, well now, folks, it's time to go to church. So he's made that kind of a trip and they're in the suburb there of Jerusalem. And now he says, okay, it's now time to go to church. So he didn't need to be called and said, hey, we missed you, you need to go to church. And he just said, hey, it's time to go to church. And this is what we do. Parents, listen to this. Please hear me. It is a great memory for your children to remember you getting up and taking your children to church. Amen. 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 It is a great memory your children will have. Grandparents, parents, aunts and uncles, take your children to church. Don't send them, take them. Amen. They will remember that all of their days. Amen? Amen. Amen. I remember, you know, and I hear it all the time. I remember my, my grandma getting up taking us to church. I remember my mom and my dad taking us to church. Take them to church. And then over in verse 41 of Luke 2, it says that his parents used to go to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. 
Every year they went to the feast of the Passover. Every year he made that 84 to 85 mile trip to observe the, the feast of the Passover. Every year they loaded up the donkey and they went down to celebrate at Jerusalem. Every year they did that. Let me close with just a few thoughts around the life of Joseph. Uh, Joseph inspires me. I hope he does you as well. Here's what I want to share with you, and then we'll close in just a minute. Refuse, folks, just refuse to allow your circumstances to dictate your faithfulness and obedience. Joseph just said, you know what, I'm going to be faithful and obedient. It doesn't matter what's going on. Even though my marriage or so-called marriage is kind of like a little bit shaky, and I don't quite understand everything, what's going on here, but I'm going to remain faithful and obedient. God's going to do this. God's going to guide me and direct me, and God's going to speak, and then I'm going to do what God says. So no matter what the circumstances were, he stayed obedient. So let's, let's just say this, church. Let's just refuse to allow our circumstances to dictate our faithfulness and our obedience. Amen. We should refuse that. We should rely on divine guidance. We should rely on grace. We should rely on mercy. And we can rely on the knowing of God's promises. Amen? We can rely on his character and his intent to overcome different difficult things in the world. I mean, we know our God, right? We know that we can depend on his character. We know we can depend on his promises. We know we can depend on him bringing us and carrying us through that. So we can rely on him in all things. We can trust him, folks, believe me. We can trust him to do all things. We can trust him. We can rely on him for that. And folks, here's another one. Live not by what is happening around you. Live by faith. Live by faith. Live by faith. Live a righteous life. And the only way possible for us to do that is through that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, here's a promise. God will produce in you a strength like he did in the life of Joseph mm -hmm. that will stand against ungodly kings like Joseph did, against Satan himself and every force of evil that can come against us. Joseph stood, and we can stand the same way. And I saw this on Facebook. Some of you may have posted this. It was about a stepfather. Does anybody remember posting that? Because I saw it on Facebook, on your Facebook, or maybe somewhere. Anybody in here a stepfather, or a step grandfather, or a step uncle, or a step mom? Anyone in, in that case? We have a lot of that in our world because of the, the family and so on. But I really like this. I saw this on Facebook. Boy, the boy, I thought, man, that is the sermon right there because this applies to Joseph so much. Listen to this. I hope this will encourage you all. Joseph was more than a stepfather. He was a father who stepped up. Amen. 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 And that's what we need. We need men and women to step up. In their homes, in their families, in their churches, in their communities. Step up, folks. Last thing I'll leave you with. Whatever you think you are, wherever you've been, or whomever you've been with, the only thing, the only thing that's going to define what you are, what you will be, where you will be, and with whom you will be, 